Thank you, and I've been advised to uh, try and prevent politicians from going into being vice-chancellors, so I'll try to make it sound negative to go that way. Actually, it hasn't been. It's been a, a, a nice shift. Uh, Secretary, can I say hello to you and to the service chiefs who are here? Uh, can I particularly acknowledge the uh, vice-chancellors of uh, Colombo University and of KDU, uh, because the main purpose of my visit to Sri Lanka has been to sign two MOUs with the universities and we have four of the staff of Mass University who are here, two who will present uh, during the symposium and two who have been part of the discussions that we've had. We've had a very productive time here and we're looking forward to furthering our engagement with both of those universities on behalf of uh, my staff and yours. Thank you for the warmth of your welcome and we look forward to working together with you. My, my topic might sound a little bit different to the ones that you have been listening to because they've been very focused on conflicts and uh, reconciliation. Uh, James mentioned a moment ago that uh, reconciliation is certainly no stranger to any of us in the room, but in New Zealand it's taken a, a somewhat different path. Uh, during the, the colonisation period, we're talking back in the 1800s, there was a, a major conflict between the indigenous people and the British settlers, uh, which resulted in uh, the British settlers becoming the dominant group in that country, and for a long period of time, uh, you would define New Zealand as a country that was shaped around the values and ways of life of those, those British uh, colonists. Now, that conflict uh, came back, uh, as was mentioned by James, around about 30 years ago, and began to emerge as a, as a major conflict in our country. It caused a whole series of, of uh, difficulties that affected families, affected businesses, affected people in their, their own family life and so on, which was then uh, resolved, if you like, and we hope this is the case in our country, uh, through an effort to go back a century and a half and say, what were the injustices that occurred here? Uh, obviously, the colonisation process led to war. It led to the confiscation of land. It led to a word that's been used, injustice. And the argument was that that should be fixed. And the way it should be fixed is to re-enliven a treaty that was signed between the Crown and the Indigenous people in the middle of the 1800s, Treaty of Waitangi, as it is called, because Waitangi is where it was signed, and to begin a process of inviting indigenous peoples in their iwi or tribal groupings to make a claim for justice to be seen to be done by settling economically through an apology and through a process of discussion injustices which were over a century and a half old. And I would, I would claim, I think most New Zealanders would claim, that this has been an enormously successful process because it's seen a 20 or 30 year period of discussion, injustice being serviced, surfaced and settled in a way that allows the country to carry on moving on. Now the, 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 com the comments I want to very quickly make is the way that universities run alongside these conflicts and help assist the country move forward by that focus, as the Secretary pointed out, on development, social development, economic development, but keeping the country moving forward so people have got something to look forward to, they feel part of the country, and as a result, the reconciliation process that was taking place through the Waitangi process was running alongside an effort to try and use education, use universities to keep the country moving forward. And that's quickly, very quickly, the comments that I want to, to move forward. Uh, as was mentioned before, I've moved from government to university and part of my role over the last 20 years really has to be, in, be involved in a whole range of efforts to have policy which might help move the country forward. I thought I'd just include very quickly uh, Massey University where I have gone to operates in the middle of the North Island, I'll come to in a moment, in the capital city of Wellington in the largest city in New Zealand, which is Auckland, and we are a major distance operation as well. So we're essentially just people felt that they could identify injustice, and one of the comments made today about language uh, was one of the key, key triggers for people to start arguing at that time, because Māori wanted to speak Māori, 
they wanted to live as Māori, but the dominant language everywhere you went was English, there were no opportunities outside the home to speak the language at all. There were no, no broadcast opportunities, no education opportunities to be able to use this language, and certainly not in the world of business. It just didn't happen. So what we were watching is a slow, steady build-up of pressure through the 1960s and 1970s in New Zealand that somehow had to be released. One of those triggers was going to become the treaty, but education was one of the other ways of releasing that pressure. So in the 1980s, we began work on what we called learning for life reforms. And the argument was to say that universities must turn outwards and begin paying attention to social, economic, technological changes. The heart of this was to say, this country is now going to require its institutions to begin to address the issues that are causing tension in the society, rather than isolating it themselves and saying, we'll get on with our own business and whatever happens outside will happen outside. First change for, for us. Second change was to say, on the back of this in the 1990s, the doors of, of tertiary education had to be opened to a wider diversity of people. Because even though the numbers of people at universities in New Zealand had grown dramatically during the 60s, 70s and 80s, they were still largely coming from the same population base. They were still largely people who were of British origin, European origin. So you very, very seldom found Māori, for example, teaching in a New Zealand university or being a student at a New Zealand university. And if you just follow through that decade of the 1990s, you can see the very steady rise in the numbers of people who are attending uh, the university. That little niche where you see it go upwards is due to the, to the introduction of a loans system. In New Zealand. And I know one of the things the government is considering here at the present time is a bill around financial assistance for people to be able to go to university. That introduction of that loan scheme is very heavily responsible for that jump in participation and a jump in participation from non-British origin people going to university. You saw a wave of people coming through universities, coming through our other tertiary institutions who were from different backgrounds. Why? Because they tended to come from low-income households. They could not afford to go to tertiary institutions. Once a loan was available, they took it and went. It's a real change in the, in the mix of, of the population that went to university. Once again, what we're watching here is a release of pressure in a society. You're hearing people say universities are responding to change. Now they're opening the doors to a wider range of people. So People are not saying, I'm shut out, I feel I can't belong. And along with their arrival, you see the emergence in universities of a whole range of curricula which addresses the needs of these people. For example, you begin to see Māori spoken at universities. You see Māori studies departments form in universities. You get a, a social change going on inside the university that releases once again that pressure that was building in the society. The next step, and this is the most recent one, has been to move from asking universities to respond to asking them to take more people and make them more diverse to saying the government now is going to set out a plan which is going to have clear priorities that the universities must respond to. Now, many of these are to do with economic development, to do with social development, environmental goals that the government wants to see addressed, all of which are intended to try and keeping the, the country moving in a direction where people are feeling like their needs are met, that they are part of where the country is going, and that they are seeing real changes occur that allow them to take their lives forward. Universities in New Zealand are now required to look at that plan, develop their own plan in consultation with people around the community, to take that plan back after that engagement and submit it and they are held accountable for that to make sure that they have actually delivered on their goals. And to go back to that example once again of indigenous populations in New Zealand, the requirement on universities is to increase percentage-wise each year the number of people who are succeeding in the university. So once again, you're seeing that pressure removed from the society by the role that the universities are playing. If you're wanting to um, follow that, 
uh, there's a website just at the bottom there that I'll pause for a second, a second on just to point out that you might be able to visit, which is the um, archive.org.web site, which you might want to, because there's a lot of papers written around that time about how the university might, might change. The same has happened in research. Because we have a research tradition which has been very much oriented towards disciplines, much of the research has not been about the issues that have been concerned to the wider diverse populations that occupy New Zealand. The introduction of things such as the Performance Based Research Fund, which is the way we fund research in New Zealand, has encouraged academics to begin to think about what they are researching, what kind of accountability they have to their community, what kind of, of communication they've got with people who are around their community and whether their research is really relevant to what is going on in the country. So the teaching and the research has begun to change in a way which allows once again for that move forward of, of the country. Now, I won't go through this, but this has meant a revolution, really, in the way universities operate. And, of course, you'll be feeling this as universities all around the, the world people are. And that is that instead of inward-looking universities focused on disciplines, you're now seeing universities outward-looking, strategically focused, with well-developed plans that run through their research and their teaching and the way that they operate around the world, engage with populations in their own community, the way they take on big complex issues that confront their society, the way that they try to work in new ways with people, with IT, with the way they run the universities, so they're much more engaged with the societies that they, they are in. So this is a picture, by the way, of uh, MIT, which is uh, very obviously very outstanding university. So a 21st century university, from what we have been trying to develop in New Zealand, therefore, is much more strategically focused and clear about those strategic goals that they are trying to achieve within the national context and within the international context. They are entrepreneurial in the sense that they are willing to do new things, that they are willing to take risks, that they are willing to engage in different ways with people and they're being encouraged to do that, to not just rely on old habits, to do things in the way that were done before, which would be so easy to do, but to break out of those habits and do things in a very different kind of way has been essential and that they are ecological universities, and that means that they are connected to their communities, that they feel that they are part of the system of their local community, of their national community, and of the wider world community, that they don't just focus on themselves, on connection with other universities, but the broader community is where they see themselves as belonging. And so the argument we make in New Zealand is that our universities are drivers of change, and that they have been successful in ensuring that a society which has become increasingly diverse, increasingly open to risk of issues, has had to settle major historical dilemmas that run back 150 years, they are being required to drive change forward and take people with them in a way which, as the Secretary pointed out today, can help the process of rebuilding a nation so that people feel there's opportunity for them and they are part of it. That's what we feel our responsibility very much is in the role that we play in our universities in, in New Zealand. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a few comments. I hope they are useful in that broader context set by the Secretary this morning of how to move from that period of conflict to how to ensure that over a long, sustained period of time, conflicts will be inevitably there, but how can universities, how can education contribute to ensuring that those conflicts are taken forward in a positive way and resolved in a positive way that contributes well to the future of the country? Thanks for listening.